and you're the Chris Hansen when they walk in, you're like, have a seat. Yeah. <laughs> right. The cops are outside. Wait, who's Chris Hansen? Oh my gosh, to catch a predator? Oh, you. That's funny. It's Jessica Ben. <laughs> you walk in and you're like, have a seat. We need to discuss. You call I love me. That. I thought you meant Chris Harrison, like from The Bachelor. Oh. They come in, it's like, Okay, welcome to the Unsettled Podcast. Which episode is this? Number seven, a lucky number seven. Oh my goodness, number seven, we're getting up there. Hope you guys have all been enjoying it with us. We've been having a lot of fun. Um, we are really excited about this week's episode. Um, we are talking with Senator Rubio out of California, Senator Susan Rubio out of California. She's going to be speaking about domestic violence, domestic abuse, and just kind of the work she's doing to help victims of abuse and, you know, um, kind of myth busting and taking on misconceptions. So really excited about that. Um, and for those, oh, go ahead. No, you go ahead. For those watching <laughs> the Phoenix Rising documentary on HBO Max, she has really been front and center in pushing forward uh, that legislation. Yeah, which she wrote it. She wrote it, which she's going to get into that today, but it's very, very important work to extend the statute of limitations for these survivors. And we'd love to see it. We're going to be taking <laughs> your voicemails and we're going to start off with a little LIB. Oh, you thought it was over. Oh, but man, do we have to? We have a quick update, I think. <laughs> yeah, we have yes. to. All right, so let's just jump right in. Okay, so it's been a few weeks since the Love is Blind reunion, right? It's been like two or three weeks. Um, and bombshell on social media. Well, a few, right? So uh, Shayna is engaged. We're, we're clapping because we just love to see happiness. And um, that was interesting. I, took the, I think that took a lot of people by surprise. But I heard someone, a little birdie, told me that Kyle, who was who she matched with in the pods was engaged uh -huh. to, he proposed to somebody else with that oh-so-romantic special ring from his grandmother before oh, he proposed no. to Shayna. That's what I heard. Wow. That's is this public I knowledge heard. or is this going around on social media? Uh, probably a little bit of both. It might be under NDA even. Probably so a little bit of both. Interesting. So, really interesting that that was not shown. Yeah. Wow. I also heard Natalie was proposed to by someone else. So oh. this happens quite a bit. I almost got proposed to by someone else Okay. as well. I happened to just see a picture of him this morning and I completely forgot about that. Oh, um, you don't miss him. But he was him. such a great guy. No, he was awesome. And I wouldn't let him propose. Actually, he was going to his proposal day. And I said, oh, I don't want to ruin this for you. This, you what know, do you mean? He was going to propose because uh -huh. there's, there's one day called proposal day so why would you ruin much, it for him you know what's gonna happen or they wouldn't be there um <laughs> i didn't want him to ask me to marry him because i wanted him to have that opportunity only one time for whoever that lucky lady will be in his life okay so then I'm you wanted play. me to turn him down no i'm just thinking like <laughs> okay so i'm thinking from um the listener perspective here and somebody will will say well okay you were okay with mark proposing to you well, I accepted the proposal. I accepted Mark's proposal. So when the other guy proposed to me, I knew I wasn't going to accept his proposal. So I didn't want to oh. put him in that terrible position. Well, you left that part out. <laughs> well, did I get engaged to him? No. <laughs> I thought you were like, you know what? Don't do this to yourself. Oh, no, well, that's no. really sweet of you. But yeah, I guess there's sweet just guy. a lot of stuff that isn't shown. It's a very a lot it's of stuff. A interesting perspective. Yeah, it gets chopped on the editing floor. Lots of behind the scenes gets chopped. So that is interesting that you almost had another husband and apparently Kyle almost had another fiance. Wow. That is such interesting it's information. It's something. And then... And he used the grandma's ring? Yeah, apparently. Allegedly. Okay, I think that's a piece of information that people need to know. And now they <laughs> Come will. Come on. Our, our listeners will know. <laughs> and we how about Shake? Details. Shake has a new girlfriend, apparently. 
uh, per his Instagram. And it's a little shady, the caption that he posted, because it's like, Let's don't, it. don't settle or something like that. And it's a picture of him and his new girl. And it's just like, okay, so was he saying he was settling on the show? Like, what was he saying? It's just kind of shady. Uh, that's a little rude, but I, you know, I don't think he's <laughs> having, a, having a filter at all right now. What do you think about that? <laughs> um, I'm happy for him. I'm happy for everyone that finds love. Okay. I think he's probably throwing it in people's faces. But yeah. I'm happy that he's found love. And, you know, we go on after these shows. It's probably been eight, nine months since they taped. That's and true. And it's a lot to go through. Um, His so, caption says, good things come to those who wait, don't settle. And it's a picture with the girl. Comments are off for what it's I worth. I can't imagine she isn't getting trolled as well. Oh, for Ben sure. gets trolled, too. When we first got together and when we got engaged, she was getting trolled. It's like... They didn't do anything wrong. There is the innocent new relationship. That's just but so interesting. No, we're happy for him. Okay. You know, we're happy for him. I'm, I'm glad. Definitely well wishes to both of them. We're stirring as, the pot today. Well wishes to both of them <laughs> as they embark on new journeys in their lives with significant so others. Uh, apparently, Shayna has joined the Engaged Club, so... Maybe we'll have her on to talk girl. about her engagement. I, I don't even know that. if she posted about it. I saw she, it on E! News. It's interesting. She didn't post about it, and E! News did. So I don't know what happened there, but I know that if it were my own engagement, I would want to have the ability to post about it first. So I'm not sure what happened there. Mm, like she maybe but, told them or something? I don't know that she told them. Mm-hmm. Um, right. So I have no There's idea. always a way these outlets figure stuff out, right? They find stuff out. Yeah, they might have leaked it. I don't know yeah. what happened. Maybe That's that too leaked. bad, though. Well wishes for her, though. We're excited for her. Okay, um, Jessica, have you ever been in social media jail? <sighs> what do you mean? That means when you're, like, locked out of an account because you've been bad. No. You've been trolling somebody or you've no. had some hate speech. I or... haven't. Have me, you? Me either. We're boring. We have you, are wait, boring. okay, and so I, have you ever reported a comment? Yes, you have. A million. <laughs> I've blocked, so if you look at my block list, you'll be scrolling for days. <laughs> and this past week, I've been, I've been reaching back out to people. Who you've People bought? that have been coming through who are being rude and just shaming and trolling. I've been responding to them, which I never do. And it's just so funny to get most, most of the time they don't respond back to me, but it's so funny, um, to actually do this. Yesterday I participated in something. Some people didn't think I should have, but Shane posted about this comedian who he felt was shaming him and talking about some psychological issues that he has. So I go to her profile Lo and behold, she was also shaming me a couple of days ago. And I'm like, lady, I haven't even been on this show <sighs> two years. I taped this four years ago. So I also shared his story. And she then jumps on her stories and is basically crying, saying, now all the trolls are coming after me. And I'm so sorry that I did this. But you really have to think about someone's psychological health when you're putting the stuff out there. So this is so interesting that you're responding to people who are trolling because I think most trollers, when they comment, they're just like, maybe it's like a vent session kind of thing. They're just like, let me get it out there. And that's that. So when they get the notification that you've responded or that someone's responded, they're probably just like, Oh, I wasn't really expecting this. <laughs> yeah. I can't, I'm sure they're embarrassed. They should be. We were talking about it last night and Ben had an idea for a new show. Okay where he would reach out to trolls or anyone who said a rude comment to me or whoever it is and invite them on a reality show where they'll meet celebrities and they walk into the door and it's me sitting down and we have a conversation. And About trolling? We just have a conversation and then they get to experience actually being in the room with a human that they've shamed or trolled and just get their experience. How do you feel? <laughs> I, you know. that's a great idea. I mean, I, that's really funny. <laughs> I 
they could be onto something. And you're the Chris Hansen when they walk in. You're like, (laughs) have a seat. Yeah. (laughs) Right. The cops are outside. Wait, who's Chris Hansen? Oh my gosh, to catch a predator? (gasps) Oh, you. That's funny. It's Jessica Benton. (laughs) You walk in and you're like, have a seat. We need to discuss. You call me. I thought you meant Chris Harrison, like from The Bachelor. Oh. They come in, it's like, will you accept this rose? You know, I've never seen The Bachelor. That's such an oh, unpopular wow. whatever. I haven't seen it in a long time. Well, okay. So we have reported people, because I've reported people, like hate speech and just yeah. stuff that I just feel like is, I don't know, even if, maybe it's a little petty. I'm like, Ugh, report. I, I, I just want Facebook to check it out. Just check out, check it out and let me know. Like, you know, and I don't know. So, you know, the work that the Phoenix Rising um, has done. Speaking of, did you watch it? We both watched it. Yes, we both watched the Phoenix Rising. And even if you didn't watch it, even if you, like me, like have very limited knowledge of Marilyn Manson and Evan Rachel Wood, I know her from 13, but it is such an, how would I describe this documentary? It is almost like... um, Jaw dropping, I would say. It's shocking. shocking. The first episode, I was just thinking, what? You know, you kind of like saw this couple, I guess, years ago. You're like, all right, they're dating. Never thought, you know, what was going on behind the scenes. um, The biggest thing for me, the biggest thing for me is like, these two couldn't be any different. How did this pair come together? But once you start watching this documentary, you see that there's a grooming process that he went through very deliberate and the age difference between them was what 15 maybe closer to 20 years 20 years and he deliberately groomed her and she looked up to him because he was this rock icon and she was also in the hollywood space and i think that's how but as a teenager right she's in the hollywood space as a as a teenager and so you know, there's there's so many opinions on this topic and especially this relationship. And, you know, I've seen the Marilyn Manson fans online already, like getting their <laughs> their pitchforks out. They're ready to rally. But, um, you know, it's regardless of how you feel about the relationship or whether or not you think there was one, because I think they did date for four years. When you watch this documentary, you're going to say, okay, this guy was like a very mature adult kind of taking advantage of a teenager. Right. Absolutely. No matter how you slice and dice it. He was an absolute pedophile. And I'm so proud of her for coming out against him because he has so much, speaking of people who have power, he has so much power and he has all of these fans behind him. And I can't imagine the courage it takes to come out and speak out against him. And you see her breaking down when she posts, she was counting down actually the minutes until she was going to post and name him. Mm -hmm. And, Mm -hmm. you know, it's really hard to watch because, you know, undoubtedly there will be retaliation. Yes. I, I, but I did, I think the documentary, which was directed and produced by a woman, I think it did a really good job of kind of um, showing the viewer how someone like a, Evan Rachel Wood, a seemingly very successful young woman, um, a teenager at first, and kind of, you know, the world was her oyster. How, how she became attracted and kind of in this relationship with this, oh, yeah, man who is just not attractive, <laughs> not anything. I mean, like just uh, like even her kind of describing him. Like at one point in the documentary, spoiler alert, she says that. He was whipping her with a Nazi whip from the Holocaust. Like, to date somebody who would even have that is a problem. Not to mention the fact that I think she's Jewish. Yes. Or she, yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, it's just unreal. Yeah. But it did open my eyes to um, Mm -hmm. lots of other... um, I don't know, what am I trying to say? Not perspectives, but the world of domestic violence. Because I think sometimes we think that domestic violence is like, gosh, he knocked your tooth out. And like, you got punched, like that is domestic violence. And this is like so much more than that. This is all mental. This is physical. This is just like every part of um, like abuse that there could be, right? Absolutely. And in this day and age, you hear so much more about psychological abuse. And Senator Rubio has done so much work to bring, 
you know, this to light to actually be per, to be credible in court, which is really important because, you know, a lot of a lot of a lot of victims of domestic violence don't have things recorded where they, you know, they know they're going right. to end up, you know, going up against their abuser. Right. Um, so it's it's great that, you know, their concerns will be heard. And I thought that was like, so not genius, but I'm like, that is so great that she had, that Evan Rachel would have had a diary where she was able to jot down notes and like have these memories her. and um, kind of go back and look and say, this was the day things changed. This was the day I knew, you know, this was an abusive relationship. This was the day Absolutely. I met him. Like all of that was just so interesting. And um it is hard. I, you know, personally, I don't think she really has anything to gain from this. I did read Marilyn Manson's lawsuit because he's suing her for defam- defamation and uh, some other things. Um, I read his lawsuit and he's basically saying, you know, she regrets her time with him and she regrets that maybe she's best known for being a, a freak show's ex-girlfriend instead of an A-list actress. I mean, the, the mm-hmm. lawsuit is really like coming after her and and the stuff he's saying in there is like she's just basically jaded and she's just bitter interesting i mean the documentary shows a whole different side of that um you know but i guess you have to see both sides as well i can't imagine though there was a room full of women who had very similar stories to tell about their interactions and relationships with him and you know even the band member who was willing, or I think he was in the crew, who was willing to finally speak out against him, that was really powerful. The fact yeah. that all these people saw and no one said anything um, until somebody oh. finally stepped up. I was so happy to see that happen. Yeah. And I can't even imagine like rock culture in the nineties and like early two thousands and like going on tour and just like, obviously this is very much pre me too. And just kind of like, there and he are was no beating rules. women on stage. <laughs> Come on. He was beating women publicly on stage. But you know There's what? I, I'm curious, though, because, like, he obviously had a very large, and maybe still does, has a very large fan base. People liked him. People liked his music. People liked his persona. Maybe outcasts who feel like they didn't fit in. They weren't in the in the cool crowd in high school, whatnot. Um, so I think yeah. that is where a lot of the defenders right now are coming from. Like, sure. you know, he filled this space for them when they felt kind of, like, outcast and so now they're coming to his defense and saying yeah well she was you know in a relationship with him for four years and blah 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 and um you know I would I would tell her uh listeners yeah check out the lawsuit too kind of like I don't think you could make your own decision because nobody was there right besides those two but um just for another perspective I think absolutely and keep a journal that's I mean right Keep a journal, especially if you're dating someone with this Jekyll and Hyde type personality, which she said he had multiple personalities. Sometimes he would be Marilyn. Sometimes he would be Manson and it would be a totally different thing. And when his old bandmate came back into the picture, he became this totally different person. Yeah. I think that's something a lot of people deal with in relationships. Yes. You never know who you're going to get. Yes. So, you know, I think the journal is, is genius. Yeah just to document the behaviors and, you know, just make sure that it's, I always remember, I remember very little from psychology 101, but one thing I do remember is this phenomenon of the boiling frog. So when you're in a relationship and the, and the water gets a bit hotter, just like when a frog is being boiled, you just get used to it. Right. Mm -hmm. And then it gets a little bit hotter and then you get used to that. And then it's boiling. Like as behavior, you're used aggressive. to it. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. So, you you know, your aggressor becomes a bit more violent and then a bit more and a bit more. And you can, you basically just normalize and accept it. And then they kind of move on to the next level. It's very scary. That is very scary. Um, but I, I can't say enough good things about this documentary. I love documentaries and was so excited for this one to come out. And it's only two parts. And I think it's really eye opening, jaw dropping, shocking. So, Definitely check it out and let us know what you think. I mean, I think that, um, you know, I don't want everyone to think they need to like 
um, write in and be like, can't believe, you know, this, he did that. If you're a Marilyn Manson fan, I would love to hear from you. Or even if you're not and you just kind of have questions or, you know, you'd like something cleared up or maybe, you know, you're buying into some misconceptions, which we're going to talk about in just a little bit. Let us know, you know, this is kind of a safe space for everybody, right? And so Absolutely. I've seen the questions. People have questions online, you know, um, we might not be able to answer them, but we could take a stab at it. And we would just love to hear kind of all perspectives. We're going to get into um, the interview. California State Senator Susan Rubio will be joining us in just a moment. She was actually elected to the California legislature in 2018. Prior to that, she was a school teacher for 17 years. Whew. Wow. It's a lot of kids. It's a lot of serving kids. Um, she was a local elected official for 13 years. She was actually born in Mexico. Um, and the proud daughter of a former worker and housekeeper. Um, and she's actually a domestic violence survivor herself, as we mentioned earlier. Wow. So really unique and front hand, first hand experience to everything we will be talking about. So she's going to be joining us next. Hi, you look beautiful. Hi, Thanks Senator. so much for joining us. Of course. Thank you for taking an interest on such an important topic. Really oh, appreciate yes. it. yes. We appreciate your work. We know time is limited, so we're just going to jump right in. I'm Ashley. This sure. is Jessica. Uh, first, we want to talk about Phoenix Rising and the Phoenix Act, which we know is now legislation. Can you just briefly tell us how you got involved in this? Absolutely. Well, first of all, uh, I am a survivor myself, and uh, when I got elected to the state Senate, that was my top priority to, to work on legislation that would help victims of domestic violence in, in many ways, uh, not only strengthen the laws that already exist, but put forward legislation that would help them. And, you know, there's always other victims out there advocating. And I knew that Evan Rachel Wood was one of those individuals that have been working really diligently trying to change the laws as she also um, is a survivor and had personal experience. And uh, they reached out to me and it was just a good collaboration. We both have the same goals in mind and that's how the Phoenix Act came to be. And so it extends the statute of limitations that a victim has to report or press charges on their abuser. Correct. And so we know uh, just based on, on data and research that it does take an average of eight years or so for a victim to get over a trauma. Clearly, uh, some will be in relationships for, for many years. I knew one victim that was in a relationship for 18 years. And so for those listening, I hope they could just envision 18 years of, of torture. And it takes a while before victims can speak up. Uh, I knew that uh, Evan Rachel would have been working on the Phoenix Act. She had been trying to change the laws to uh, extend the statute of limitations uh, in California before the Phoenix Act. Victims had only three years to come forward and press mm -hmm. charges and seek justice. Um, that was not enough. Uh, as a victim myself, I can share that it is really difficult uh, when you're dealing with a society that's not necessarily ready to hear these stories. Uh, there's a lot of challenges in terms of victims often not being believed. Uh, there's a lot of uh, shame that comes along with being a victim, and it takes a lot of time for victims to come to their own conclusion when they feel comfortable to speak up. And so Evan Rachel Wood, along with a coalition, came up to my office and we were working on this bill for an entire year and we were successful in passing it. So luckily we're, we were able to extend it from three years to five. Uh, we had started with uh, 10 years, which, you know, we had hoped we would be successful, but nonetheless, uh, two more years for victim is a success in itself. So I'm very proud of the work we did and so honored to have worked with amazing women and the coalition behind the, the Phoenix Act. That's so amazing. And no doubt she has some fear of retaliation. I'm sure a lot of women that experience this, they have that fear of retaliation, which pushes them, you know, further and further down the line to be able to, you know, take action against their, their, uh, abuser. whoever had done this to them, to their abuser. Um, is she, you know, especially given um, someone with a big following, is there any protection that she has against retaliation from groups surrounding um, or fans of an abuser? Well, the reality, it doesn't even have to be someone like Rachel Evan Woods or someone as high profile as uh, her case was. 
I think that every victim, no matter who you are, you're always fearful that there is a group of people that are not going to believe you, which is often the case. Uh, and then there's friends and family that sometimes also um, come with the territory. They don't believe that either their, their child or someone they know could have done this. So there's always retaliation for any victim. And so we're always very careful uh, when we deal with victims. That's why I really pushed on uh, legislation that would help in, in that regard. So for example, um, I did pass a bill last year that will allow victims to testify remotely, which is something that was so needed. I, we know that victims recant all the time, not because they don't want to speak up, but you start hearing of threats that are being made to them. So if they're able to testify remotely, they don't have their abuser in front of them. They don't have the family in front of them. It's so much easier for them to be able to tell their truth. And so the bill that I passed now will allow victims to share not only remotely, but also file restraining orders remotely, which is really an important piece of this because victims are often fearful that if they go to court to file, they will run into not only the abuser, but also, like we said, other members of his or her family or friends that are trying to retaliate and force them to change their mind. Let's talk about the Right to Pause Act. This is some legislation you are currently working on. And is this the first of its kind or where have we seen this anywhere? And, and why did you want to draft this? Uh, yeah, it is. Um, I haven't seen it anywhere. Uh, the reason I wanted to do this because uh, we know that victims that have restraining orders sometimes go through a lot of trauma with an, even when they have a restraining order. And what I mean by that is I already interviewed a few victims who say that even with the restraining order, they have their abuser coming at them with uh, either threats or showing up, really just pushing the line a, li a little. This particular legislation came to be because there was a recent case in Sacramento, which is horrific. Uh, a woman had a restraining order against her abuser, but the abuser had the opportunity to see the children. And I think it's important that there's always a relationship with, with the both parents. In this case, I believe it was severe. So he only had visitation rights with another person there. And uh, recently in February, uh, the father of three young ladies, not only killed his three daughters, but also the chaperone. And uh, after the investigation, it turned out that he had been harassing the, the, the victim that had the restraining order. That was one part of it. But he had also been arrested for assault on another individual. I believe it was a police officer. And he was also held in a 5150, which was um, an involuntary psychiatric evaluation. So as a victim myself, and as I interview many other victims, we know that these are patterns of escalating behavior. And so those should have been red flags. And I believe that the parent of the three little girls, uh, the, the victim that had the restraining order, I believe that she should have been notified I believe she should have had the right to go back to court to express this to a judge and show evidence of escalating behavior uh, as evidenced by the assault on the police officer and the hold, involuntary hold for psychiatric evaluation. And I think at that point, a judge could have determined whether or not it was safe to continue to allow the, the, the parent with the restraining order to continue to see his children. So that's not the case. That is not law. So my law will try to give those parents the right to pause visitations just enough to go to court and see if there's something that they can explore to see if the situation is getting more dangerous. And I believe in this case, it would have saved those three little girls' lives. The work you are doing is just so incredibly important. What are the biggest challenges in getting legislation related to domestic family violence or, you know, domestic violence against uh, spouses and partners? What's the hardest part about getting this legislation passed? Well, you know, we are in a very progressive state. I'm a progressive legislator, but uh, when it comes to victims' rights, I'm always very mindful that we have to be careful with laws. And what I mean by that is typically some of the laws that I put forward are not necessarily always uh, supported by some groups that I value and I respect, and I know why they exist, but uh, for example, the ACLU um, was not in favor of the Phoenix Act, and they believe that if we strengthen laws, um, rightfully so, they will probably create more opportunities for 
for uh, people of color to be incarcerated. So I understand their hesitation. So that's kind of the challenge, trying to do the right thing, respect these groups who are in opposition, and a lot of education on, on what really happens to victims of domestic violence. So another question for you, um, we talk a lot about social media on our podcast and how it can influence, and I have been the victim of a lot of bullying and trolling online. Um, you know, many people have said you should commit suicide or I'm going to kill you and things like that with, you know, some of the laws that you're getting passed so incredible. How do you see social media playing into all of this in terms of, you know, being able to bully someone? We kind of see that playing out with some of very high profile people in Hollywood right now. How do you see that really limiting um, victims? Well, you know, social media is just, um, it's a way to connect, but it's really created a lot of challenges. And I'll share with you, I was a teacher for 17 years and uh, I used to see some of my students already just displaying bullying behavior on, online. And we had to educate our students on, on how important it was to not only protect their image, but how harmful it was to be saying horrific things about uh, you know one of uh, their fellow students online. And so this is uh, really started growing exponentially in terms of our children not understanding how dangerous it is. And then it goes unchecked and they grow older and that the bullying continues. Uh, by way of example, one of our little girls that was a fifth grader at the time, I believe 11, year old, 11 years, uh, was putting photos that were so inappropriate of herself, almost naked online. And, and so again, they're so young, they don't understand how this is going to impact them in the future. But then we also had um, a group of uh, mean girls, if you will, bullying another little girl and uh, and she tried to harm herself and so we have to be really careful it's not only harmful to kids but as adults as you've experienced I think people think it's okay and they get a free pass because they're online they don't understand the consequences behind their actions we see it across our country there's been children or teenagers who've committed suicide because of the bullying they've uh uh, been harmed in so many ways. And so I think this is just beyond domestic violence. This is just generally, we have to work harder to not only educate our, our kids, our, our young individuals, our teens, and everyone else of how important it is for them to be mindful that the person on the other end receiving either the harassment or the bullying, it really could lead up to someone committing suicide. So I don't think mm -hmm. they make the connection because it's not in person. So we need to fix that. We need to continue to push and educate. Do you think we'll ever see internet policing or social media policing? Obviously the issue there is inhibiting our freedom of speech, right? Well, we've already been trying to work on some of those areas. Um, recently uh, we met with the CEO of, I think it's Bumble, who was sharing how it's very difficult to monitor some of the content on online because you have these dating apps where you put your information out and then you cannot stop an individual from harassing a person because you voluntarily put yourself out there. And so right now we are exploring a law that will limit some of the, uh, the, the things that they're able to post. Uh, you, you may argue it's uh, freedom of speech, but the reality is that we have to figure out how to limit some of that freedom of speech if it's really harming another individual. So we're working at it. It's very touchy with so many groups as it pertains to, again, uh, our liberties. And uh, But it has to be in a way that we can speak freely without harming another human being. And so we have to draw the line somewhere. Senator Rubio, um, wanted to get your take, and especially because you have some experience here, uh, there are a lot of misconceptions when it comes to domestic violence and domestic abuse. Some people might watch the documentary Phoenix Rising or just listen to women's cases or men's cases and say, well, why didn't they just leave? Can you speak to that? Absolutely. And it's something that I have often spoken on. I, I do a lot of talks around not only my district, but uh, I've been asked to speak and, you know, internationally, which I'm really humbled and, and honored to be able to do. I really, um, you know, try to educate just our community that when you say, why didn't she leave? Essentially, what you're saying is you're calling that individual a, a liar. And I shared with you earlier that I've had um, hundreds of conversations with many victims and 
just trying to um, gather information and data for my own personal use. And I, I mentioned earlier, I have a, an individual that spent 18 years in a relationship. And then we have others that last a year. So the trauma really depends on the severity of the abuse. And that is why I also passed a bill, uh, 1041, which is course of control. And I don't think people understand that piece of it. And my bill now uh, has changed the way people talk about domestic violence. Uh, prior to my bill, we used to go to court uh, either with a broken bone or, or a black eye to say we are victims of abuse. Now my bill, uh, which again, put course of control, control on the map, says that a victim can prove abuse if they have been manipulated. Uh, a lot of it is psychological um, trauma, and, and that's what abusers do. Slowly but surely, they start isolating a victim, uh, removing friends and family. They won't allow them to go out. They won't allow them to go to school, better their, their circumstance, because they know that if they have a better job, they may be able to leave. So the point I'm making is that it starts before the physical assault. They start being brainwashed and being isolated. So when the physical assault comes, these victims are so traumatized that it takes them that much longer to leave a relationship. So it's not an easy formula to just say to a victim, why didn't you leave? You have to contend with issues of, you know, do I have a child? Do I have to worry for the safety of my child? Uh, do I have finances? Can I go get a, you know, a home? Uh, right now, I also have another bill that's exploring um, in, uh, just gathering data on victims of domestic violence that end up homeless because there is a correlation. When we talk about victims leaving, what people don't understand is that sometimes they don't have a choice. We're asking them to leave an abusive relationship or end up homeless on the street. And I'm not even sure if that's a choice anyone would make easily. And so again, we have to consider each individual, um, each circumstance individually. Everyone deals with a different trauma. I don't have children, but others do. And I've heard their stories, how these individuals threaten to take their children away, threaten to kill their children. So I would ask anyone listening out there, it is not an appropriate statement to make. Why didn't the victim leave? Because unless you're in that circumstance, you don't know all the issues that they're dealing with. Love that perspective. Amen. Um, thank you so much for joining us. We, we really do appreciate your time and we really do value everything that you are doing um, in California. So thanks so much. Yeah. Thank you so much for the work you're doing. You make me a proud Californian. Thank you. And I just want to add one more thing if I can. Of course. Um, the, one of the first bills that I passed, again, based on what I saw in my schools, uh, I saw some of our teenagers already pushing each other, yelling at each other, taking each other's phones away, which is coercive control. Uh, I passed a bill that now mandates that every school has the domestic violence hotline in the back of every ID card from seventh grade all the way to higher education. So anyone that has a child or a friend, if you look in the back of the ID card, if you need any help, the number is there to support and help. And so I'm very proud that we're getting information out there and that we're educating and I will continue to push for victims. I want them to know that they're being heard, they're being seen and that they matter to us and we'll continue to work on their behalf. Oh my goodness. Thank you so much. Um, I know. Uh, thank you guys so thank much. So much. And thank you for your service as a teacher. 17 years. That's incredible. <laughs> that is so cool. Thank you for thank all the work you. you're doing. And, and anytime, I'm really glad that you guys are putting a spotlight on this issue is very near and dear to me and so many victims out there. So I appreciate the work that okay. you guys are doing. Absolutely. Thank you. Right. All right. Have a Bye, great day. Guys. Wow. Just speaking of movers and shakers, Somebody who comes out of a situation being abused, you know, by your husband and having this platform, stepping out of being a teacher from 17 years and into this platform and really making change, you know, I'm so honored to have had her here today. And as, as she was talking, I was thinking of so many things. Yeah. I feel like there are so many stories playing out in Hollywood right now that play right into this legislation that she's trying to get passed. To totally. Law. Yeah. And, you know, of course, top of mind was Kanye and this right. entire messy situation as she's talking about, you know, the situation that she just experienced in February. Well, um, she not, she didn't experience it, but that happened in Sacramento. Well, she's in, but, the midst, she's right. in the middle of it now. Right. And this is what's so scary. And Trevor Noah came out on his show this past week 
and talked a little bit about his experience with domestic violence. His mother was married to a violent man and she tried to get help. She went to authorities, she confided in friends and family and no one believed her. And then Trevor got a call from his brother one day and he was told that his mother was shot in the head by her husband at the time. And as Trevor is seeing the situation play out with Kanye and Kim, he's really putting Kanye on warning at this point because this is the type of thing that he saw happening in his own family experience. Right. Yeah. So he I, came out against Kanye. Oh, for sure. Yeah. And, and you know what? I think at first when, when Kanye was kind of like posting about Kim and Pete and just the divorce and the separation, I think a lot of people thought it was comical because Kanye was being Kanye and this is kind of what we've come to expect from him over the past few years. Um, and then people kind of moved into a space where they thought it was a little obsessive. Okay, like he's posting every single day about the situation. This is weird. Like we're watching his every move. I had a friend who turned notifications on to see when Kanye would post, right? And I think we're in the space now where we're realizing like, oh, this is harassment actually, and this is dangerous, and this is bordering on, you know, something really bad. And so Absolutely. kudos to Trevor Noah for speaking up because he, he yeah. does have that experience. And he made a really good point. There's no one else in the world that has probably more power, more followers, and more money than Kim Kardashian. And if the most powerful woman in the world can't get away from an ex, then what does it mean we have a rest serious of us? problem on our hands. <laughs> right. Yeah, so kudos to the senator for the work she is doing. Um, um, I believe it's called the Time to Pause Act, the Right to Pause Act, um, which would pause visitation for somebody who is becoming increasingly aggressive, right? Um, not to stop them from seeing their other parent just because, or it's, it's really to keep them safe. You know, it's like, absolutely. <laughs> you share custody, this, but you want to keep your kids safe. Absolutely. And that's, that's obviously very important. And the other thing is with Kanye, obviously there's a lot of psychological abuse, right? So she may not have black eye or bruises to show, but the psychological abuse is there. And that's another act that Senator Rubio is trying to get passed to be able to present psychological evidence, of um, psychological huge. harm in the courts. Because and people, absolutely. just because you can't see bruises or marks, like people have absolutely been abused mentally and psychologically. And, you know, I'm so glad we're living in a time where we're recognizing mm -hmm. this and trying to address it. And, you know, um, the senator is just incredibly progressive and these are progressive acts and hopefully laws and, you know, hopefully the rest of the states will follow suit because it's a really big issue. Well, I'm so excited. I feel like it's happening all at once. They're dropping all of these really awesome documentaries and series and movies okay. at the same time. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I'm super excited. Well, of course, Ben Affleck is my favorite. He's your favorite. And he has a new movie out. Called? It's actually with his new girlfriend, or his ex-girlfriend. So that'll be interesting Jennifer to Garner? see. Jennifer Garner? No, that's his ex-wife. Well, who was his ex-girlfriend? <laughs> I don't know. You, you're, <laughs> like, <laughs> you're like, it's with his ex-girlfriend. So naturally, I'm going to say, well, who is that? I have no idea. Oh, we'll get her name. I want to say he met her. She was a makeup artist that he met on set, I want to say. Okay. We will get her name. But okay. it's called Deep Water. Super excited okay. about that. Okay. Um, we crashed on oh, Apple TV. I love all the we, the we uh, drama. Oh my gosh! Well, I actually work at a WeWork. Yeah. When I go into the office, and I love it. Um, I How watched do you a feel documentary about... last year. Oh Did yeah. Did you see that? Yeah. And it was interesting. So I love uh, the casting that they've done on this. I never realized his wife is cousins with Gwyneth Paltrow. Yeah. So did that's going to be a big you, you didn't part listen of the to the one podcast. No. There's a really good podcast about this. Oh, really? Um, yeah. But the whole WeWork thing is just, it cracks me up because it's just like, um, whatever documentary it was, and they were at a conference and some guy was passing by and he's like, is this a cult? <laughs> <They're>, <laughs> Like, uh, I mean, the, what's his Adam Newman? He's loaded. He's filthy rich from it. That's right. I, I feel like it's think. a common theme amongst Silicon Valley. Right. They're shooting for the dreams and 
end up in a bad place. Like, didn't he trademark the name and then, like, sell it back to the company or something, like, outlandish like that? Yeah, and sounds like it was just a total mismanagement financially. They were going through... I think so. They were going through money like water. But it's so interesting because people are like, you I know, know I, understand, I understand the tech... <laughs> What's that like? I understand the the tech, like the Elizabeth Holmes and like the, like, you know, the Steve Jobs and like all these tech companies. WeWork was literally real estate. So that's why it confuses me that it turned into this like super cool. This is where you got to work. This is, it's like, it's like, it's just real estate. It is super cool though. It's very cool because it's a communal space. I, I've been in one. I they actually, have them in Atlanta too. They have them everywhere, great. I think. I work out of one in West Hollywood, and I actually met Jay Shetty at a WeWork. Who's that? Oh, he's this really inspirational speaker, and he's got a huge following on Instagram. Come on, the sh- come on, come on the show. We love you, Jay. Come on, Sorry, Jay. I'm gonna oh, he's, do he's my research. Best. Okay, we should absolutely reach out to him. Actually, but no, I love it because you can go. We actually have a little office in there, but you can choose all sorts of different spaces that you want to work in. They have little yoga rooms. There's free beer on tap. And it's just a space to meet people and be creative. And it's very relaxed. So I love it. Okay. You, you are team Adam. Well, I'm team you <laughs> work. <laughs> <laughs> you love what Let he, me watch the movie and I'll get back to you. Oh, I'm excited to watch that though. Cause I, I love like a good implosion. Um, I started watching, and I can't remember the name on Netflix, but it's the, uh, I think it's like number one actually right now, the restaurateur who, the woman who had the vegan restaurant in New York and how like a man um, kind of was a really bad influence on her and somehow they swindled a bunch of money. I don't know. I'm only on the first episode, but apparently it's like a really well-known story in New York and it's where Alec Baldwin met his wife, Hilaria at this oh, really? restaurant that she founded. So I'm so excited. I mean, that's probably what I'm going to do with the rest of the night. So I'm excited to watch the rest of that. So that's what I'm watching. Yeah, you'll have to shoot me the name of that. Jeez, what I is it called? I know, I almost want to Google it right now because it's in the Netflix top 10. It's like Bad Vegan or something. Hold on. Okay. Yeah, really interesting. I'm also fall from excited Grace. about... It's what? A Fall, fall from, from Grace. Grace. Yeah. It's always a dude. <laughs> Just kidding. Yeah, it's called Bad Vegan. Oh, okay. Yeah. Very cool. I'm also excited. I think in less than a month, Kardashians comes out on Hulu. There's going to be some drama in there. They're going to have Kanye, Tristan, and Scott Disick. I love Scott. The Lord. You do? I do. How do you, you like, not love the Lord? Um, I don't like... I don't, I don't, why, am I, I just, why am I saying it like that? <laughs> I'm not sure why you're saying it like that. I just... I think he's kind of problematic, right? Like, I don't know. I've just never been a huge fan, but I'm... I think he's sweet. I I think he comes from a good place. Okay. He also has some really great athleisure. Okay. He's also got 17-year-old girlfriends, right? Not anymore. Oh. I think they broke up. It was Lisa Rinna's daughter. Lisa was No, but then he's moved on from her, and I think he's dating, like, one of, like, Kylie's ex-friends or something like that. Whatever. Didn't Tristan do the same? If he's the same one, I don't know. No, Jordan is Jordan up. is living her best no life. She looks great. Can't Jordan, keep up. Jordan's killing it. But no, I, I totally understand. Um, so that's, I guess, what we are watching. Are you reading anything? Oh, I can't stop reading things. Um, <laughs> <laughs> no, this is so weird. Like this past week, every single day, I ordered a book on Amazon. Unreal. Like, well, I had pre-read She's Unlikable which if you've seen Indian matchmaking, you know, Aparna, it's her book. So good. I got that in the mail. Okay. Um, and then I ordered, have you heard of the, ah, oh, what do you call it? Ma- Medical medium. Oh yeah. I've got his book. I haven't touched it though. I need to. I got his book because my therapist was telling me that I needed more iron and she pulled oh. out this book and she always pulls this book out. So I'm just like, what is that? I'm just going to get it. So she was trying to figure out where I could get iron into my diet. So I got that book. I, I really am super intrigued by him, though, um, for, for several reasons. And maybe because my parents are Islanders who kind of really value kind of like, you know, like that. drink ginger tea and, you know, celery juice and that kind of thing. Mm-hmm. Um, but I do want to read the book. And it's in this house somewhere. I don't know where it is. <laughs> 
Well, I'm looking forward to some of his recipes. Yeah, I mean, like, take and leave some, right? I guess it's, like, with, yeah. with, all, with all diets and whatever changes in lifestyle. Exactly. It's kind of like, you can't do it all, right? Exactly. So, um, I also got this really trashy novel. Now I don't want to say the name of it. I, <laughs> what do you mean by trashy? I feel like we would never be in the same book club, Ash, because you would not want to read this novel. It's about this woman who became obsessed with her boyfriend's ex-girlfriend. And I just go... I kind of numb out and just read through it. And it's probably not the best use of my time. Is it it's good? Like watching TV. It's so good so far. I'm just tearing through it. So I like that. I mean, I, yeah, I don't know. I feel like, how does it make you feel when you read it though? Great. I don't feel bad. Cause okay. I feel like I'm using my brain cause I'm reading. <laughs> I can't stop reading. Um, okay. Perfect. Perfect. And I think we've got some callers on the hotline. Or just Hotline bling. Let's see. I think this is from Sarah Beagle. Thank you guys so much for calling in. We, this is like our favorite part of the week when we get these. Best. <laughs> About um, the shade that people get for being on these shows and how I understand. I did a local radio station bachelor contest and I they picked four girls and we had to go on the actual radio station like on the station and they would ask us questions that we were unprepared for and then he picked the top two people that he actually wanted to go on a date with so this was all sight unseen I didn't know what the guy looked like I only heard like the brief description they gave on the radio I ended up making the top two girls to actually go on a date with him and he showed up he was nothing like what they made him out to be um come to find out you know the guy didn't even have a stable career, etc. But what really astonished me was how people on the radio station's page were putting me down. Like, people were p- picking either me or this other girl and putting me down, um, saying things just about my little 30-second edited clip from the radio, who didn't even know the date or how it went or how this guy treated me. Um, there were some people on my side, but, you know, I'm a really emotional person, and I took it to heart. It, it was really hard. And so I can't even imagine being on um, Love is Blind and having that multiplied by millions of people viewing from around the world. Um, so I just wanted to send all the love. Um, and I think that's a good reminder for people not to shade uh, some of these cast members on Love is Blind. Um, love your show, guys. Keep doing great. Putting Aww. yourself out there is hard. Thanks, Sarah. Thanks, Sarah Beagle. Well, I can resonate with that for sure. I, I definitely thought one of the storylines of Love is Blind would be that, you know, I definitely thought my partner had a job and then he didn't come to find out once we were in the real world. Um, so it sounds like that's kind of her experience as well. She was sold one thing and then in the light of day, it was something totally different. I experienced that too. And then I thought that would be the story. The story was something different. And then being shamed um, obviously is really hard. So I totally feel for her. Yeah. I don't know. I'm just thinking I've obviously never been on like a dating show, radio or Netflix. So I'm thinking, hmm, how does this apply? But I mean, people are the worst sometimes. Absolutely. It can just be horrible. So Sarah... Good for you, girl. Well, you know, I'm really excited to hear Senator Rubio talking about getting some policing in place for social media. So if that's, it sounds like that's where, you know, the vehicle for the shaming was happening. Um, there's hope. We have, you know, people out in the world who are trying to get laws passed for this kind of thing. And I do know, obviously, we have an international audience. The UK mm-hmm. and other countries do have laws that are passed for mm-hmm. internet trolling and things like that. The US isn't, isn't on board yet, uh, mm-hmm. but we're, we're glad to see it. So many, there's just like a lot of, gosh, getting stuff like that passed is probably just not going to be easy here, you know? Because like she said, it's like if you solve for one thing, it's also impeding on, you know, something that could be totally different. So. Totally. Well, I think that is all for today's episode of the Unsettled Podcast. Thank you so much. Of course, we are going to beg you guys for your reviews and what else? Your subscriptions and 
Um, More hotline calls. And your hotline calls. We love you guys so much, and we just love the support. And maybe, like, let us know some topics you'd like us to talk about, because we're really moving into a new space um, outside of Love is Blind. <laughs> like, we're still going to talk about reality shows, because hello. Yes. But, you know, we want to we want to talk about what you guys want to hear. So, let us know. This is a collaborative effort. Thank you, guys. 